When you're below baseline in dopamine, you're not going to feel that good. Really low dopamine, you're going to be looking at things like depression, experiencing really low mood. That depression from the neurobiological perspective, when you can't be bothered to do anything, can't be bothered to get out of bed, can't bother to eat, all of these kind of things, you're low in that driving energy, that driving dopamine chemical. So typically, I've always been looking down this narrative of, you don't want to be below baseline dopamine because low dopamine is not going to feel good. Your brain also has an additional chemical when you're going below baseline called dynorphin. When you go below baseline, dynorphin releases into the system, which actually gives additional psychological pain, mental stress, anxiety, whatever it may be, as a mechanism to try and reinforce something wasn't right with what you just did to me there. You took me too high too fast. So I'm going to add in this chemical to please say don't do this to me again. When you have the big crash after a long TikTok scroll, or the crash after alcohol, or the crash after junk food, crash after porn, when you actually feel extra crap, it's because of this dynorphin chemical is coming in to try and say, please stop doing this. DJ, how are you doing? Hey man, how's it going? Good to be here. No, thank you very much for jumping on. I think first thing that I want to really set the stall out with is that today we're going to be exploring how the listeners, myself, from a selfish point of view, can understand neuroscience a little bit better to optimize our mental health. So why don't you just start off by giving us a little bit of a background on you, what drew you to psychology from younger years to the position you are now. Just take us through it. Yeah, so... What drew me in early on, I actually played a lot of golf when I was younger. That was kind of my original dream to go into the professional golf space throughout my youth. And with that, I also started experiencing a lot of the sport kind of performance based psychology. So that began to spark the interest when I was young. And then throughout my teenage years into sort of like 16, 17, 18, had some pretty tough experiences with loss and family trauma and things like that, which really like deepened my perspective on mental health and my own mental health and things like that. St chose to study it at university and began to love a subject for the first time in my life. Like I didn't fully connect really with school necessarily, but once I discovered psychology, I was like, wow, this is so super cool. And then, yeah, chose to master into the neuroscience space and start getting really into these brain chemicals. And was super fortunate during the masters, I was down at Exeter University, south in the UK. And I got offered this job to become a lecturer at the university and start building out some kind of third year university modules and start teaching. And I was given quite a lot of freedom to teach, which was really cool. So that suddenly opened this door into like maybe speaking on mental health, which I hadn't really foreseen. And that opened some cool things. I started speaking at other universities, Oxford and out in Toronto Uni. And then I kind of was on this route down, let's go into kind of uni professing lecturing. And I was in Toronto when COVID kicked off. So I came home and I had all this training that I'd been delivering to students. And I kind of thought maybe I could also use this in companies and schools and things like that because mental health was suddenly a big, big challenge when COVID hit. And then, yeah, two and a half years on, this is now kind of a company that's training schools and uh, organizations in neuroscience and mental health. Fantastic. And it's interesting that golf was what drew you in because I, I, well, I don't play as much golf as I would like to, mainly because I know how sadistic it can become <laughs> the, the negative self-talk. But I, I do understand the fascination psychologically that comes from golf because it is a real ball by ball battle with yourself. And it's actually an analogy I often use with more silver haired gentlemen at company, executives, board members that don't necessarily understand why there is a mental health conversation going on with these millennials, these Gen Z, all this stuff. When in reality, golf is the example I always use because how many times can you come home and say, "Oh, shut your clubs on the floor and be like, oh, I completely lost my head, couldn't get back on, couldn't get back on the on the course from the thirteenth hole." You know, well, if that can happen within eighteen 100%. holes of golf, then of course that can happen on a day to day basis. So, why don't we just dig into that a little bit deeper? Because growing up playing golf, mm -hmm. the the real battle that you had with it, I can imagine from a good day versus bad day. What thoughts started to generate in your head? What started to actually draw you down that? What were the initial questions that made you think, I want to explore more about psychology? I just found it so fascinating in golf, how you could be having like a really good day and things could all be going to plan, the pre-plan, the, the night before plan, you have a great day of golf. And then like 16th hole, you could kill your whole day and kill your whole mood because of one bad tee shot. And I just like would go through these huge psychological fluctuations when I was playing. And I was so young, like I was really playing a lot of golf from like the age of like 10 years old. So emotionally, like I wasn't that mature. It was maturing me fast because I was having to deal with it. But it just began to draw me down this question of 
how do I learn to kind of let go of like a really powerful emotional state so that I can move forward? And I was like every young golfer obsessed with Tiger Woods and Tiger Woods had this capacity to just completely let go of chaos when he was playing and move on. And that question of how the hell do I figure out how to let go of these emotions began to draw me down. Maybe psychology has got some answers. And it seems like it's it's given you some at the very least. And one thing I, I want to use as a foundation for the rest of this conversation is something I actually saw on your social media, which is the eight pillars of mental health that you refer to. It's yeah. not dissimilar to a, a, a sort of framework I use when speaking to corporates or schools. And I, I refer to mine as anchors. In cool. that there are ha- habits and behaviors that I know are beneficial to me. They're obviously all different for each and every every person. So mine is uh, some obvious things and then some more specific things to me. But yours are pillars for mental health in general mm-hmm. terms. So why don't you just run us through what those are and why they're important and why you think those are the most critical, critical things to consider? Yeah, definitely. So when I look at these, my big fascination is why are we now experiencing this big shift in mental health? This is what the question like I'm constantly thinking about every day. And when you share what you mentioned earlier about maybe, oh, why are millennials having a tough time in their mind? Is it just because it's like awareness of mental health? Is that what's taking place? I'm very keen to really explain that I don't think that's what's happening. I think a huge alteration in how society is living is causing this mental health challenge. And I think the awareness is fantastic because it's bringing a big problem to the forefront of society. But when I look at these pillars... I'm really interested in how, do, how we really biologically designed to behave. For hundreds of thousands of years, we were running around tearing through forests and hunting and building and climbing. And I think given we did that for so long, we are just biologically designed to do things in a certain way. And nowadays, a lot of it is falling away in how we live our lives. So when I look through these pillars, that's the motive. So first one, when I look at the pillars, is the ability to focus, basically. I really believe our ability to concentrate is absolutely essential, and it's something that's super hard now, like many of us really struggle to concentrate on a task or concentrate in a conversation, whatever it may be. But being in a state of attention, really, really important. Something that social media is having a huge effect on, and when we go into these chemicals, I have this kind of formula for these chemicals I'd love to kind of take you through to help you and the audience understand them. Focus is a big part. Then got things like connection, our ability to connect with other humans, massive, our ability to connect with ourself, which takes us into our third one, which is our self-talk. This is huge. I think this is such a foundational pillar. You mentioned self-talk with the uh, the golf. I definitely experienced a lot of that negative, critical self-talk when I was playing. And whenever I'm working with organizations and schools, I think understanding how you're communicating with yourself is so foundational because that loud, critical voice can make making good quality decisions pretty hard, whether it's to do with booze or phones or anything, food, whatever it may be. You've then got movement, connects massively with I know what you're into. We're just designed to really physically use our bodies. It's a really key part of us. Movement goes in also with gut health, so the quality of what we fuel our body with is a really foundational pillar. You've then also got your sleep, which again, movement, food and sleep, I see them as just all kind of interconnected. And then we also have our technology, so our relationship with the tech. I obviously, this organization is called Digital Mind, and it's because I kind of come from the position that I love tech. Like I was speaking at, in Oxford Street yesterday, and I was near the Apple Regent Street store in London. And like for me, going into an Apple store is so fun. Like I just love technology, I find it so exciting to be around it. But with the love for it, I also massively understand the challenge that it's bringing to society and to our mental health. And a good quality, healthy relationship with tech, I think is potentially the most important thing we can have now. I, I entirely agree. And there's so much that we can unpack from those eight pillars. And I think it'll probably unfold as we go. So I'm going to boldly yeah, step, it will come step, in the chemicals. step into that, that real, that real big question, which is I'm constantly wrestling with the question of how do I cultivate a healthy digital relationship with the digital side of what I do from a work point of view, the digital mm-hmm. side of how I engage from a personal point of view, where are the boundaries? What's good for me? What isn't good for me? Oh my God, look at my screen time for the day. How can I do that? <laughs> but a lot of what I do is is bound by that technology. So I can't be too hard on myself, which ties into the self-talk. Here we go. The narrative is running through it. But you do, yeah. from your experience and from an understanding of the science and understanding the people behind the science, the people, i.e. you and me, everybody else, how in the modern world do we cultivate healthy digital relationships? Yeah, so... The biggest thing to understand is 
Technology has a huge effect on this dopamine chemical. Dopamine is, is so vital for us as a human being. Dopamine is the chemical that is fundamental to keeping us alive. That's why you have it within you. It's basically to motivate you towards behaviors that are gonna keep you alive. So if you go back in the day, it might have motivated you to hunt or forage for food or connect with people or build shelter. It's like this really core cool motivating chemical. And when we, over hundreds of thousands of years, experience the dopamine reward, it would have been heaven because these are the most sought after things like successfully finding food or building shelter or having kids or having sex. These are the moments we felt the best. And over time, we've began to basically realize, oh, maybe we can get that dopamine hit without having to put in tons of effort. But the challenge is when you have a normal natural dopamine hit that you'll experience, maybe when you're exercising and you're pushing yourself, these kind of things that earn reward, you have these nice gentle fluctuations in dopamine. When we look at, say, social media, for example, it's immediate pleasure straight into our brain. Like we go into TikTok and it's like, wow, that's so entertaining or wow, she's really good looking or wow, that was really funny or whatever it may be. And dopamine spikes fast. So dopamine goes up really quickly as soon as you go on social media rather than a gentle climb. When dopamine spikes up fast, it's forced to drop below your baseline level in order to kind of get back to its equilibrium. And it's in this below baseline level that our mind goes into difficulty. Because you can imagine if this chemical is designed to keep us alive and we're low on it, the system's not going to feel that good. So with your question of how do we cultivate the healthy relationship with the tech, it's all about frequency of usage and duration of usage when you're on it. So if we're really frequently checking it, like if we're working and then every five minutes, little scroll on social, little scroll on social, you're never giving your dopamine a chance to climb back. So frequency is really important. So having prolonged periods of time off of the tech, and I teach this whole digital detoxing concept. And then also when you're on it and when you're thinking, oh, it's the end of the day, like I definitely deserve a nice scroll on social media, which is all good. Like I also love doing that. It's just don't do it for too long because there's, the longer you're in there, just the same as don't drink too many drinks, but it's all right to have some drinks. It's the same concept. If you drink 10, you're gonna feel pretty crap the next day. If you drink two, you'll probably be all right. So frequency and duration is kind of the key with building the healthy relationship. It's fascinating as well because my understanding of sort of recreational drugs in general is that a come down is where you sit below that equilibrium for longer because yeah. you've gone so aggressively below. So to put it into to sort of realistic terms, obviously it's a much more aggressively spiked in one direction and then the other with that sort of thing when it comes to synthetic drug use. But mm -hmm. that is, it's the same mechanism, isn't it? In terms of day-to-day -day human interaction in our brain, it's the same thing mm -hmm. happening. Exactly the same thing happening. And something, a recent discovery that, I've been uh, really researching and there's a chap called Andrew Huberman, you may have heard of him, he's kind of becoming the king in neuroscience now. There's this whole concept that when you're below baseline in dopamine, you're not going to feel that good. Really low dopamine, you're going to be looking at things like depression, experiencing really low mood. That depression from the neurobiological perspective, when you can't be bothered to do anything, can't be bothered to get out of bed, can't bother to eat, all of these kind of things, you're low in that driving energy, that driving dopamine chemical. So typically, I've always been looking down this narrative of you don't want to be below baseline dopamine because low dopamine is not going to feel good. Your brain also has an additional chemical when you're going below baseline called dynorphin. When dynorphin, when you go below baseline, dynorphin releases into the system, which actually gives additional psychological pain, mental stress, anxiety, whatever it may be, as a mechanism to try and reinforce something wasn't right with what you just did to me there. You took me too high, too fast. So I'm going to add in this chemical to please say, don't do this to me again. So that is when you have the big crash after a long TikTok scroll or the crash after alcohol, the crash after junk food, crash after porn, when you actually feel extra crap, it's because of this dynorphin chemical is coming in to try and say, please stop doing this. So I, I, I hadn't heard of dynolphin before right now, so I'm immediately incredibly fascinated. And it is a, mm -hmm. a, it's a deterrent. It's an in inherent deterrent that we all have as human beings to not negatively or not reinforce negative behavioral patterns, I guess. Isn't yeah, it? And, exactly and, that, which is fascinating how clever this thing is that we're living in. <laughs> very much so. And I, I often talk about how I try to be, not, not, not to the point of making life boring and analytical, but I try and be very analytical about the decisions I make on a day-to-day -day basis. And mm -hmm. it, we are what we consistently do. And the decisions I make in terms of I, I very rarely drink um, 
on a recreational basis now because I know it affects my sleep. I know it affects my mm-hmm. overall circadian rhythm. But I also know that there will be social occasions where I will enjoy having 12 beers. And <laughs> what I do it's now is, is I, factor, I factor in the surroundings and the lifestyle decisions and the broad metrics around that rather than being so black and white about things because I can analyze how I feel either side of these. Mm-hmm. And I know on a day-to-day basis, if I'm not drinking booze recreationally, then I will feel better. But I also know if I miss out on a social occasion, then I'll and I don't buy buy in. I'll spend the whole day thinking, oh, just I'll just be in this weird headspace. So what do I do? I look at it, look at it analytically, and then make informed decisions. But that informed decision comes from the analysis that I've made about previous decisions. So it's interesting mm-hmm. to know that there is a an actual chemical that is accentuating that within my brain. Hundred percent, and it's super interesting because I'm sure you've heard of the endorphins chemical before. That's the one that really is designed to reduce pain, physical pain and also psychological pain within us. So from a evolutionary perspective, the absolute core function of that chemical is if you were suddenly, I don't know, faced with fighting a bear or something, I mean, it'd have to be quite a small bear to have a chance, but if you were fighting a small bear and it scratched you, endorphins would release into your system in order to reduce the pain of that scratch so that you'd have a chance of surviving that situation. Similarly, if you're running away from an animal, it would release to reduce that pain. So whenever you're pushing yourself really hard and you're physically pushing yourself, endorphins are going to come in to reduce the pain you're going through. Endorphins very selectively is the opposite word to dynorphin. So endorphins are reducing pain within us. Dynorphins are adding pain to us. So they're kind of sisters guiding one another. So it's fascinating, isn't it? Because I'm now, I'm now reflect- alcohol seems to be the buzzword here, but if you're reflecting on a hangover, which is something mm-hmm. the majority of the UK will it's a have, big topic. <laughs> have experienced, is you can often find that you lean into negative behavior patterns even when you don't feel as bad as you expected to because you are by definition hungover that day. And mm-hmm. that's potentially allowing dynorphin to, to beat you that day. But there might be mm-hmm. instances where it's, where it's right to work against it because obviously resetting that equilibrium is the priority when we are in that situation. So should we always take the lessons from dynorphin or are there times where there are methods and things that we can do to try and reset and get ourselves back to equilibrium faster? Yeah, that's a good question. So there's kind of two sides of dopamine. Dopamine will always return to baseline if it's left. If you do nothing, it will always come back on its own eventually, as long as you're not harming it further. So if it's really low, a waiting game will bring it back. So on a hangover, you could do nothing, and eventually you'll come back. If you wanted to speed up the time in which dynorphin leaves the system and dopamine returns to baseline, it very simply follows a rule that if you do things that are effort, you're going to experience a reward of dopamine. That's the core function. It's just to make us put an effort to our life. So... Even if you take something as simple as cleaning your home, like you you think, oh, I really need to clean the bathroom and the kitchen, or I need to redo my bedroom or my cupboard. These are things that are effort. But typically when you do them, it's like, oh, actually quite satisfying now I've done that. It's like that feeling of accomplishment. So on a hangover, the best thing you can possibly do is just do a few things that are a bit of effort, a bit of cleaning, a bit of movement, cooking yourself a good meal, something like that. Effort is going to basically get you back faster than uh, doing nothing. Interesting. Very interesting because it's something that, again, without knowing the science behind it, I've intuitively sort of picked up on over the years that this is a better thing to do in this situation. Mm-hmm. Do this more, Fergus. And from a more relevant example at the moment is I'm in a bit of a slump, which I anticipated and have learned to experience. So post Keltman, which is mm-hmm. the most recent po- podcast that I spoke about my reflections on, it was yeah. almost a fortnight ago now. But I know there is this phenomenon of post event depression post-event slump whatever you want to call it i don't want to coin it as post-event depression because it's very temporary and it's it's you mm-hmm. can anticipate it but it's that culmination of hard work equals reward that comes to an end and mm-hmm. even though i know there's there's more on the horizon i know that i've got plans for what's next i'm straight back into a working day i'm straight back into training i'm straight back into eating habits all these things the previous thing that was such a fundamental component of my day-to-day life is now gone so whilst that void has been filled the reward has been received and and there's that slump that's come from from that spike upwards Mm -hmm. so for me it's understanding what can i do in these post-event periods which is always going to be improving i'm always going to learn from what are the habits and the things that i can do to try and bring myself back to Mm -hmm. the optimal position away from that slump and it's things like getting straight back into a positive training regime and having that mapped out beforehand it's having all my food bought 
from the supermarket before I get back from the event because nice. I will just move away from. I'll just it's think, oh, you've you worked hard, you've worked hard. Oh my god, a fortnight's passed and you haven't been to the shops. Just little things like this, and it's just it's trying to get ahead of it. And I've picked up on that over time, but I am still, to be honest, coming out the back end of a little bit of a period of a slump. But mm-hmm. I knew that was coming. So it's a, it's obviously a, it was a fifteen hour race, so it's a very big day out for for context for people that are listening. But it's the same effect in many ways because it's the the result of a, a prolonged period of of effort, and that can manifest itself in people's day to day work, <laughs> their work relationships, their family relationships, can't it? So it's a, it's a constant case of analyzing how you respond to certain things and then trying to better prepare as a result of the learnings from that for next time when those things come along. And from a scientific point of view, it sounds like you've just equipped me with all the information I need to better understand that, which is fantastic. <laughs> that is good. I think it is something important to recognize because the pro- the process of dopamine, what's actually really interesting is we've always thought of it as just like a, a reward chemical. Like we do something and then we feel good afterwards. In a lot of the more innovative research that's coming out now, the most pleasurable experience of dopamine is actually in the pursuit, not in the reward of the goal. So it's actually during the, like, during the count man when you're really pushing yourself and during all of the training up to it that you're actually going to experience more of the high. And then when you hit that peak point of dopamine that the pursuit, the dopamine's been there helping you with the pursuit. And it's like, oh, the system is dialed. I've managed to complete this. It is just going to think, finally, I can drop myself back lower towards baseline, just like the other side it wants to normally climb. And it is going to fall. So often, whether it's pushing yourself like physically and psychologically, of course, in that situation, or it could be, I even remember this, like working really hard for my A-levels and having this big moment, like thinking, oh my God, it's going to be amazing when I finish. Then afterwards, almost crashing out a bit and thinking like, where's this big reward feeling that I was expecting to come? There's no fireworks. What's this about? (laughs) I know. But often the most pleasurable experience is actually in the pursuit of the goal, which is, I think, quite a motivating factor. If you know that pleasure is in pursuit, I think it can motivate you to pursue what you're seeking for even harder because you know that the joy is in there. It's um yeah process not goal oriented and I think mm-hmm. a lot of people no I, I don't want to I don't want to paint with a broad brushstroke but I think a lot of conversations I have with with athletes aspiring athletes is that they have a goal in their head that they aspire to get to but when you actually dig a little bit deeper as to why they want to set that goal it's because of things in their day to day life that they want to alleviate or rectify mm-hmm. and I get so much more value from setting a terrifying goal and then knowing what the next six months of that journey are going to do for me as an in, in, as an individual. So that actually when I get to the goal itself, it's just, right, let's get it done rather than having that pressure. So it's another, it's a pressure management tactic as well that I find very useful because if you've gained everything that you were going to gain from the process and you acknowledge that the process is just as valuable as the goal itself, then the goal mm-hmm. itself is just the cherry on top. And from a self-development point yeah, of for view, sure. from a self-development point of view, the big question I always ask is, as long as you've done everything that you believe you could in the run-up to within the context of your individuality, job done execute 100 percent. simple as that so from a going back to the sort of the the day-to-day stuff you've you've mentioned obviously the differences in the the baseline chemicals that we need to understand but are there any other chemicals that are useful to understand before we dive a little bit more into how people can manage this from their own perspective because as you mentioned dopamine is understood one way media and general narrative around this tends to make it very linear whereas it's obviously much more complex than that so do you want to just almost go through a definition of terms Mm -hmm. as such before we dive into how people can manage this better at home yeah for sure so you want me to stay within dopamine or explain the four that i think are important the four that you think are important i think just just really lay it out because um obviously we've covered them already but some people might be listening and, and trying to track back thinking which one's that again yeah cool so this is a really nice easy way to remember it so what we have this is a very fortunate thing that I realized about three months ago with these words. So you have four key chemicals that are really, really key. These are what your body biologically wants to be in harmony. If they're not in harmony, we don't feel as good. If they are, we feel bloody awesome. So you have dopamine at the top. Dopamine is your motivation. It's wanting you to basically put effort into your life. When you do things that crash out your effort and give you immediate pleasure, it goes lower. When you put in lots of effort to your job or your work or your relationships, it goes higher. The next one you've got is oxytocin. 
Oxytocin is designed to connect us together as humans. It's most predominantly released in the human experience when a mother gives birth, both the mother and the child experience this huge spike in oxytocin, which creates maternal bonding. It then is experienced loads throughout our life, any time in which you're deeply connecting with people or deeply connecting with yourself. So it really connects into the self-talk and the internal relationship. So you've got dopamine, then you've got oxytocin, then you've got serotonin, which is the one responsible for really like from a psychological perspective it's all about our mood and our happiness and our emotional state from what kind of behaviors help it it's really the chemical that wants us to be hunter gatherers tearing through the forest like when you look into what kind of things help your serotonin it's basically nature sunlight movement gut health and sleep so basically being out in in the outdoors and behaving in our instinctive way recharges the system boosts our emotional state and then our final one is endorphins. So that's the pain tolerance one when you physically push the body really hard. And if you look down that list, you've got dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphins. Down the side of those letters, it spells dose, which yep. is heaven. So you basically want to be thinking, am I getting my dose of chemicals each day? Am I doing something that's effort? Am I doing something that connects me to myself or others? Am I doing something that connects me with my instinct? So am I getting outside? Am I getting into natural light first thing? Anything like that. And then am I doing something that physically uses my body? Because they've got to be used. That's why we've got them. I, I'm, I'm pleased to hear you say that because I, I feel now reflecting on my own day-to-day -day habits that i am getting my dose which is obviously nice. a good thing i don't feel under attack which is always nice on the other end of the podcast <laughs> but do you want to just talk us through somebody with the knowledge that you have what are the things that you really prioritize on a day-to-day -day basis to get your dose um, mm -hmm. so that we can maybe find some alignment parallels or think about them in our own lives yeah definitely that's a cool question so first thing for me is when throughout your sleep, part of the regenerative process of all the different things your sleep is doing is you are building dopamine. You're building that resource as a result of if you wake up in the morning, it's pretty useful if you feel motivated and focused to do stuff in your day. So it's a pretty key mechanism. So when you wake, you really want dopamine to continue on that track upwards rather than go into depletion. So waking and immediately going into the social media, unfortunately, sets it on a path down at the start of the day, which is one of the hardest habits to possibly break because I know a lot of people love that habit. But for me, charging my phone on the other side of the room, learning to use my iPad as my alarm because the iPad doesn't have the addictive pull for me. So I have the iPad as the alarm. I don't have social media on the iPad and waking up, turning the alarm off, and immediately what I did to start kind of like breaking that pattern of straight into the phone, which is like in my day state, walking to the bathroom, and picking up my toothbrush, and immediately starting brushing my teeth. So I started to kind of like replace the phone with the teeth brushing. Then I'll go downstairs, I always go to the bathroom when I first wake up, another time that I would have sat and scrolled the phone. I now have a book in the bathroom, so I'll sit, I'll read a couple pages, from a dopamine perspective, reading is total heaven for dopamine. It's something that requires effort and focus. That's why you get a satisfaction feeling after it. Of course, it's also good for survival education. That's what that chemical is designed to do. So no phone, immediately a little bit of reading, only read a couple pages. And then my next mission is to definitely see natural light. So one of the biggest factors in our sleep is natural light first thing. So then I step outside and get out in, into a, uh, outside for a walk. So Getting outdoors is a really key part. I'm someone that doesn't, I really love to walk. Like walking is probably my favorite type of movement, but I also know the body needs to be physically pushed a bit harder than that. So each morning I do this process of going on a walk and then whenever I hit a hill, whenever I reach a hill, I sprint the hills. So that's my kind of like endorphin, physically push it. I do a little bit of press ups and stuff like that when I'm out there. So I get a bit of a buzz first thing. So those are kind of the key morning parts. I think herbal tea is really, really good on an empty stomach in the morning. So that's something I've had in my routine for like a couple of years now. The serotonin chemical is being created in your gut. 95% of it is being created in your gut. And then via something called the vagus nerve, which you may have heard of, is kind of distributing that information to your brain. So herbal tea, heaven for your gut, heaven for your functioning. Um, normally that morning period, I really aim to have 60 minutes without seeing the tech, basically. And then I've had all this time to kind of think about business, think about life, think about like I do a bit of gratitude work when I'm out there, these kind of things. And then I kind of step into the external world and let all of that kind of dictate how I feel. But waking up straight into others' worlds, I think, really throws our head off. And then throughout the day, things that I think are important is 
getting into deep states of focus when I'm working, the way in which I do that is not have the phone on the desk when I'm working. I think it's a really important thing to get good at. And then also when you're working on a task, closing email and WhatsApp and Slack or whatever you're using so that you actually stay on task because distracted working really crashes out dopamine and focused working is really good. So that's a really big part. And then food is big for me. Really go for a kind of very unprocessed sort of diet. I've explored a lot of different diets myself. I've done three years as a vegan. I've then also done like a more meat-based diet. I've done lots of different things. Typically, I find eating as unprocessed as possible and as natural and as we probably are designed to eat has been best for me. And then, yeah, connecting with people and sleep is a massive thing for me. Just making sure like that I go to bed fairly early so I get good sleep. I'd say those, yeah, a few different factors there, okay. Are there any additional habits around sleep that you think are worth mentioning? Because I know my the, the last hour before bed can make or break a good night's sleep for me. And as you said, it's uh, it's almost plugging ourselves into the Thunderbolt overpriced cable that Apple is selling us to recharge our dopamine from a human <laughs> perspective. So how do we how do we maximize that recharge overnight from your understanding? Yeah, so a few different things. The first thing, it definitely starts at the beginning of the day. The best thing I think you can do is natural light first thing because with that circadian rhythm, if you imagine just like a bell curve, if, it, if your circadian rhythm starts hard and fast by light pouring in, it goes up quick. So eventually that curve is going to go down quick. So the shutoff time is going to be much faster. So the period you're going to fall asleep is going to be shorter. So light first thing is big. And then throughout the day, I think the most important thing is just physically exhausting the body. I think so many of us are psychologically shattered when we're like working so much on these computers and phones. And then we get into the bed and our body actually doesn't necessarily need rest. It's lying there thinking, I haven't done that much today. I've been on like a short walk or something, but I haven't really been used. So I think natural light and movement is key. And then in terms of into the evening, I actually, I always had this challenge of always needing a wee in the night, which I found so annoying because I'd always have to get up. And then simple change of no longer having herbal tea in the evening even though it is a healthy thing to do no longer having it like after 8 p.m i found really useful and not really having that much liquid at all in the evening like after dinner i actually found really useful for staying deeper asleep for a longer period of time at night and then i really don't think you want to be in bed scrolling social media because it's just energizing the mind so much i think if we have to have tech in bed because it's like so habitual and it's like not an option to not i think you're so much better with an ipad watching like some longer form netflixy youtube content over like this quick move around style because that's energizing the mind and then a really big thing for me is having quite a cold room. Our bodies cool as they go to sleep. They reduce in temperature. You can imagine they develop that because we slept outside for 100,000 years. And I've always found that if the room is cold so that I always think a temperature that's good to imagine is you actually would want to be a bit cold if you weren't under the duvet. I think that's the kind of temperature you want to be at. So opening the window, I think is really key. So much of that is all tied into the biological rhythm the circadian rhythm mm -hmm. you mentioned there and it's something that the more the more conscious i become of it the more i try and frame my day around it and that's from a training perspective from a psychological mm -hmm. perspective what type of work i'm doing at what time of the day what type of meeting i'm having at what time of the day what type of training i'm doing at what time of the day and obviously yeah, this is all cool. very ideal world situation and nine times out of ten i get to 8 p.m and think oh i've got two training sessions to do how is this happening <laughs> fergus but in theory, the framework that I try and cultivate is better understanding my own circadian rhythm, having a more sensible relationship with caffeine as well is a big one that I talk about on here a mm -hmm. lot. And I generally six to eight hours. I, I think that the caffeine cutoff is is something that's spoken about a lot in the sort of fitness space and general space on social media. But I think the big key nuance is it all comes down to when you wake up because once you've got that light in your system, you have then sort of reminded your body of when what rhythm it's working to so mm -hmm. it should be six to eight hours after waking up is when I look at my caffeine curfew, which tends to be around 11 or 12 mark, which means yeah, it's nice. quite early in the Good day. For but for some people that are training post-work, oh, I'm tired after a full day of work, I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to have this can of Monster before I go to go and go to the gym box after a tough day's work. All that's doing is going to be putting you in this cycle of negatively reinforced, oh, I'm tired, I'm going to have more caffeine. What's the caffeine doing? It's making your quality of sleep reduced, which means that you're going to be more tired. What are you going to do? Have more caffeine. Rinse and repeat. Oh, 15 years have passed. I feel terrible. So from your, pers <laughs> from your perspective, what is, I assume the herbal tea is somewhat of a replacement for any sort of caffeinated beverages, but are there any 
interesting studies or anything you'd like to reference on that space for people to consider? Yeah, I think the caffeine space is really interesting. So, because I've experimented with no caffeine and with caffeine, because I do like caffeine, it feels pretty good. And I think it's something that can be utilized. I just think it needs to be utilized in the in the right way. So, I definitely don't think it should be utilized to wake the system. So, I think there should be at least ninety minutes of after waking before caffeine comes in. Because what's interesting about caffeine is we all kind of perceive it as it's something that's giving us energy. Because like you're drinking, it's like wow, well, I'm more energetic, but it's not actually technically giving us energy. We have this chemical in our body called adenosine, which is what creates fatigue. And adenosine releases into your system in the evenings and it releases whenever the body is tired. And when you have adenosine in you, you're like, well, I feel quite slow and I feel quite exhausted. All the caffeine molecule does is block adenosine. So it blocks the tired receptor. It doesn't actually add any energy to us. So you really want to be not using it to give you energy, but using it, I think, in a bit of a different way. So I'll normally use the herbal tea as my first drink. I do that not necessarily for energy. I do it more because I think it's going to really help my gut health to function well. And when my gut functions well, I just think I'm just like a little bit more optimal. And then at about 11, which is where I'll begin to experience my first like slight dip. And normally a dip for me will be my concentration beginning to fall because I'm so I don't have like crazy good concentration. It's something I have to really, really work on. So I normally have a coffee around then. And I think in general, Coffee slightly spikes dopamine, caffeine slightly spikes dopamine. So it will suddenly bring motivation and attention a little bit higher. So I just think whenever you have it, you want to optimize its usage. So you don't want to have it and then go and chill and have some conversations on like a more of a coffee break style thing. I think you'd want to have your walks and whatever you do at work, come back, have your coffee and go straight into work and actually utilize the added concentration and motivation it's providing because then it's going to utilize the chemical in a better way. But I'm similar with you. I definitely don't think after midday is a good time to be having any more. As a, as a general rule of thumb, it obviously depends. If you're getting up at 11 a.m. because you're a, you're a night shift yeah, right. or something, then you don't need to be so hard and fast on the midday rule. But interestingly, one of the sponsors for this podcast, who I will already mention for those listening, the drink that I have from them called Rise is 125 milligrams of naturally occurring caffeine with theanine as well to help balance out the anxiety-inducing effects, nootropics, and electrolytes. So that's always the first thing I have every day around an hour, hour and 15 minutes after I wake up. And it means that the first thing I'm doing is hydrating with electrolytes, with a surge of caffeine, and with nootropics at the point where generally that point of my day is where I'm sitting and doing 45 minutes to an hour of sort of work that requires no external platforms or phone usage it's stuff that i can just get down and do with my phone in a completely different room because that's where i'm most focused so i think it's important i completely agree basically with the sense that using caffeine tactically is something or or not necessarily tactically but understanding why we're using caffeine is more important than oh i'm tired energy drink let's go Mm -hmm. and uh, i think another thing that i want to just mention from a personal perspective is the difference i feel in caffeine that comes without l-theanine and with because for example a black coffee makes me jittery and anxious whereas, mm, a monster, me <laughs> whereas a monster energy drink doesn't because it contains theanine and the same with human 24 dries has theanine which balances it out a little bit more so there are things we can do to mitigate some of the symptoms that float around the Twittersphere when it comes to caffeine but there are things we can do to better manage our circ- circadian rhythm overall and caffeine management is one of them so going back to your general work with corporate schools organizations what Mm -hmm. are the key themes in the workplace that you see organizing that need more attention from a management point of view part one and then from an employee point of view part two because i think there's a bit of a generational divide in terms of how people manage this and approach these things from an intrinsic point of view that's worth mentioning yeah so from a management point of view i think this mentality of always on is the is the real challenge that we're experiencing in the mind because and this is why i think covid is one of the factors in as to why covid has significantly altered society's mental health is this expectation to always kind of be checking the emails first thing and like throughout lunch like i was working with an organization yesterday and they're still kind of all throughout lunch not really resting in any way because they're still on they're out they've got their laptop or they're eating food at the desk or whatever it may be so from an organizational point of view i think beginning to understand that the the human mind and body needs rest and performance will only rise if people rest more like there's not that this mentality of working harder is only going to reduce performance so 
I don't know if you wanted to add anything there. Oh, I was just going to say that, <laughs> that the key buzzword is so will turnover, so will income, yeah. so will productivity, which is often what gets people listening, I've found. Sadly, it does get them listening, but increased productivity and workforce equals increased turnover revenue and probably reduced turnover in staff, all things which are good. So mm -hmm. this is my opportunity to say anyone listening with the I don't want to use the word silver haired because there's plenty of silver haired men out there I've met that are, uh, <laughs> are lovely about this sort of thing. But to play on a stereotype, the age old mentality of stiff up lip, crack on, corporate environment that we've all seen on TV and have seen caricatured all over all over the place, that is actually a less produ productive way of working for overall KPIs as a business, in my humble opinion. Mm, I agree 100%. And it's been very interesting with some organizations that have really thought, right, let's give this a go. Let's really optimize break times and optimize lunches and in the evening give people proper time where they feel like they can be really off of their tech and not have an expectation to respond. How energy and then intrinsic inner motivation begins to rise if you feel like you're a little bit more respected in your role and you also have higher energy levels. So I think rest is a really important thing from a management perspective. The other part is I'm very into the relationships employees have within organizations with the management and with one another and how that then affects their mental health, their value within the organization, all of those kind of things. And with the neuroscience in mind, the oxytocin chemical is going to enable you to basically build trust within, within an organization and then also has a huge effect on your confidence and your belief in yourself within, within an organization if you're high in this chemical. So you see some companies, they just feel really bonded together and they feel like they're working as a unit and you see their performance is pretty high. Whereas when you have these more fractured organizations, not so much. And one of the biggest things with oxytocin is complimentary behavior so when you experience a compliment when someone has basically said that they value your contribution to a project or when you've experienced it in your life about your appearance or something you succeeded with a compliment as a human being is something that's really really nice to experience and from an oxytocin perspective you get this monster spike in oxytocin when you experience a compliment and i think when organizations really prioritize valuing their employees by making it very clear as to, oh, this is how you contributed to that project and it's really cool that this was how you did this. And when you begin to make that much more normal within all of their language and, and their comms inside a company, I think it can really help. And then you have a more trusting organization so you have more belief that one another are gonna execute the tasks. So I'd say rest and valuing the staff and being complimentary and understanding contribution, really, really key. And then, from an employee's perspective, I really think it's about taking full power over your own mental health and really beginning to think I've got to prioritize some of this a bit more. And I really, from like when you're thinking employees in the workplace, that's quite a dopamine environment because that's working. And if you think when we were hunter gatherers or whatever it may be, the working environment would be hunting or building or finding food or whatever it may be. So dopamine is the really worky chemical. And I really think understanding what is my primary thing that's crashing out my dopamine. You've basically got five options. You've got too much booze, too much junk food, too much social media, too much porn, or too much drugs. So, and drugs would be synthetic drugs or vaping or something like that. So those are your five. And as you listen to that now, if you think, what is my number one? Is it booze? Is it social media? Is it junk food? Is it porn? Is it drugs? And one of those probably is getting abused in some way recognizing that that is causing dopamine to crash and it's not about oh this has to completely go like i'm a bad person if i'm doing this it's not our fault these things have been created in society and they tap into a deep instinctive part of us that loves to feel a certain way so it's not bad that we find these behaviors addictive it's very normal i have found many of those addictive myself over time and recognizing which one it is and thinking this one has got to go down a bit if i want to feel good in my working day and then understanding on the other side of it I want to be rebalancing my dopamine so every day I've got to find an activity that I want to do that is quite a lot of effort. So it could be I'm going to get much more organized with my life. I'm going to get a much more organized bedroom, work set up, workflow. Organization based stuff is really good. Could be the cold shower stuff. Cold showers are crazy good for dopamine. They've done some cool studies that have shown you can actually get a 2.5x rise in your baseline dopamine from a cold shower, which is exactly the same as the rise that you can see from cocaine, which is just mental that cold water can do that. Cocaine will peak at nine minutes and then fall below baseline. With a cold shower, you'll get a rise for about two and a half to three hours. So at the end of your shower, 
putting it cold and just dealing with the pain is a really good thing to do. So you could have organization, you could have cold water, exercise is good, focus and achievement based stuff, thinking about getting more in the zone when you're working. These kind of things really key from an employee performance and mental health perspective. And that's, a, that's an empowering thing as well, isn't it? Because it means that a lot of the power to manage this stuff on a day-to-day basis is within ourselves. And we could sit here and go on a big long rant about how the NHS is underfunded and waiting mm-hmm. lists for psychologists, psychiatrists are, th- are through the roof and it's only getting worse. And I do think there's merit to that conversation because it's something mm-hmm. that needs fixed at root cause. But I think there is a lot more that as society, as person to person, we can do more in that sense. I mean, using oxytocin as an example it's it's in, inherent in our dna in, a, in our history and our heritage as human beings that connection and that looking out for one another and achieving common goals is a part of who we are so i think empowering people to understand that there is more that we can do on a day-to-day basis to find that equilibrium and therefore better manage their mental health is an incredible thing so with that in mind and with the answers you've given what is your take on the most optimal work environment now given the balance between office at home, commuting, all of the the cluster of things that get thrown into this melting pot of what's best. Don't go on LinkedIn and have this conversation. It's messy. But hybrid working <laughs> seems to be the one that most of the bigger companies in the UK are leaning towards from a corporate sort of white collar perspective. But from your understanding, what do you think is most optimal? Yeah, I think this is a super interesting area to explore. So... From my perspective, I really think the office is very good for humans. I do think being in person and having the social interaction is very good. I do think it requires effort to go to an office, effort to commute. You slightly maybe reduce like time that you could be working because of the commute time. I think with that argument, I think it's very underestimated how much wasted time might be taking place on the phone when you're at home in comparison to when you're in the office. So I think there's probably like a relationship to understand there. But I think offices are really good for your mind. I don't think we need to be them every day though. So I would say, in my opinion, optimal would probably be two and a half easing towards three days in the office and two days at home. So two days to do your your own thing. For me personally, like I don't have an office that I go to, but I really look at my own work process and find that if I have two or three days where I go into like co-working spaces, I go into WeWorks a lot and things like that, I find it very good for my focus and it kind of, the process of putting in effort builds your energy higher and then when you're working, it's like, oh, I'm really here and I've got to do some work. Just like if we were hunter-gatherers and all the food was right next to us, we'd have got lazy. So we need to go and explore and we need to expand our minds. Like it's what it's what's required biologically. So I think three days where you do put an effort and you do go into the office and you get all the social interaction benefits and you get the more teamwork environment i think is good and then also i think what's wonderful about this COVID situation is enabling you to have a couple days where maybe from a family perspective it could really be good to be at home or maybe sometimes it's just nice to have that more like restful home environment a little bit calmer for certain types of tasks so yeah that'd be my thoughts I, I agree. And I think I think it's immensely practical as well to be able to take certain deliveries or to, to go to your doctors or to do this mm. before the workday starts. Little things that just become impossible when you're commuting every day. And I we, we, we pay out for an office. It, it's an expense that you could argue probably we could we could drop, but we do that because it means that our overall productivity, going back to that productivity, income, overall mental health, how we approach things rather than just being on all the time. I need the boundaries for certain types of work that the office gives me. Whereas home gives me certain other, well, it gives me an environment that's better for other sorts of work. Like, for example, sitting here and having a podcast because it means that there's no noise outside. There's no distractions sort of coming in and out. There's no potential delays as a result of commuting to get into the office on time. And that could cause me additional stress and mean that I'm not as present for this conversation. And I've mm-hmm. I've understood that for me, generally two or three days a week of real focus, specific work that I do at the office and then a bit more flexible things that don't need done by certain deadlines at home. I can be a bit more varied with is the best way that I've found because it means that I get that social interaction, but I also get that complete switch off, shut off the world, crack on with everything else when I close those doors. And then at home, I can I can approach things in the right way. And mm-hmm. if I think, oh, my laundry pile's got absurd, I can do that at lunchtime rather than, <laughs> yeah, true. Rather, rather than sitting in the office going, oh, no, I forgot to put the washing on, which is something that I've experienced before. And it's it becomes stressful. So... I do agree. To close off, mm-hmm. th- three low-hanging fruits that everyone listening can implement in their day-to-day lives from tomorrow 
to better look after their mental health. Go. Yes. So I know it's not, it's like a, a mid hanging fruit, but not going straight into the phone when you first wake up, I think is one of the most significant things you can possibly do for your mental health. So that would be number one. Number two would be the natural light first thing. So those two go together. I think it's crazy significant if you don't have any kind of morning routine and it's kind of just wake up, shower, begin the commute or wake up, shower and straight into your desk. I think having a slight delay where you get outdoors and you get into that more natural environment, I think is crazy good. And then the final one is really reducing the frequency in which you're checking the phone because it's the frequency that's the challenge. When we check it all the time, the baseline is getting lower and lower. And if you do it too often, our whole baseline reduces, which is what puts us into these lower psychological states. So starting to see your phone as something that's like more of a, I need to earn the experience of going on it rather than let's just check it all the time. So I've got to do some exercise or eat some food or do some work. And then I can have some time where I chill and sit on my phone for a bit. But just the I'm bored or I can't be bothered with this task, check, 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 it's really not good. So no phone first thing, natural light when you wake up and then reducing frequency of checks, I'd say would be crazy good for the mind. All things I've personally implemented at different stages of my life and have all reaped rewards. So fantastic. I completely agree. Well, DJ... (laughs) Thank you very much. Really appreciate that. And it's uh, better from a personal perspective to better understand the, the sort of neuroscience behind why I make the decisions that I do and why I promote a lot of the things that you promoted today with a lot more reinforcement, which is always nice to know. So thank you very much. Where can people find you online? Where would you like them to find you online? And where wouldn't you like them to find you online? <laughs> yeah, don't go look over here. I would uh, say best place for my content is Instagram. So at TJ Power on Instagram is uh, the best one and then i'm now getting into the tiktok space which is exciting and uh, linkedin as well from a corporate perspective all of the organizations that i'm partnered with are on linkedin so if you search tj power on any of those three those are the best places to connect fantastic well thank you very much once again and hope you have a fantastic rest of the day awesome i've loved it thanks man